I, I want to pick up on you on your theme of uh, COVID pandemic uh, lockdowns. I'm mean, here in Australia. We uh, well, Melbourne, particularly, you may you may have uh, heard, has been crowned the lockdown capital of the world. Uh, we we've been in lockdown more than any other other states and other country in terms of cumulative uh, lockdowns. Now, Steve, I I have seen firsthand the effects that lockdowns have on on the people that I that I treat. Uh, myself, family members, people in, in the general population, it just really, it really takes a toll to be constrained in one home. And it, even when you're walking out, say somebody is wearing a face mask or somebody is not wearing a face mask, there's like, a, there, there almost feels like a, a... Yeah, well, okay, let's go right to the, uh, this meaty a point of what's going on now. In the United States, over 800,000 people have already died. 800,000. How many have died in Australia? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, a, a couple thousand, I think there, there has yeah. been. Okay, 800,000. In the state of Florida, where I live, 60 plus thousand have died. And the issue is, there, this is a lot, 800,000 is a lot of people. And many of them, if not most, need not have died. The issue is, uh, first of all, vaccines help a lot, and so does wearing masks. But when masks become political and vaccines become political, people don't, take, don't follow the rules. So now people truly become threats to other people. And so we went to a restaurant today. We wear a mask to go in. We sit down. We have a booth far away from other people. We don't go off it. Usually we go in, at an outdoor, outdoor restaurants. Uh, Florida is, has a, a good outdoor season. But uh, there are people without masks and there are people uh, talking as if this is, doesn't exist um, and treating masks as if it is... Uh, uh, you're one of them, you know, not that anyone said that to me because I'm an older person, but again, there are numbers we do know that if you're over 65, um, basically that's where the deaths are occurring. So in the U.S., so uh, the older people, at least in Florida, well, actually in the whole country, but in Florida, I think it's over 90% are fully vaccinated or close to full, or are vaccinated, not necessarily fully. But the numbers are really quite good for the old people. Uh, but the old people have other things going on. They have pre-existing conditions, they're on medications. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting situation because mm. rather than seeing it as a problem for everyone, is seen as someone else's problem. And if you keep people in a state of threat, it's difficult for them to evaluate the relative risks because that's when your body's in that state, that's not what you're evaluating. I, I say that, you know, being a scientist, I can evaluate and I can this has come up with, with benefit risks. I made a statement in, on a podcast or a conference and I got some pushback because I made a comment saying that people who weren't vaccinated were in the state of threat. And I think what I really said is that when you're in a state of threat, you may not uh, interpret the data and you may be less welcoming to any form of intervention because you now see those as other forms of risk. I think the latter, the way I am saying it now, I think people are, are retuned to see greater threat when the threat may not be the same. So when we were talking about uh, when the background noises and the rumble of place and my body gets into a threat reaction and I'm making a narrative and I'm blaming you, I'm creating a story. I think when we're in the same state of physiological destabilization, we'll create a story. And the story will not have this objective reality that we would like. Now, what the person said was that I was really saying that if people don't agree with me, they must be in a state of threat. And what I really was saying, I'm even in a state of threat. And the issue is that when we're in states of threat, we have to be very cautious about our decisions.
Mm. And everyone evaluates, as you said, their their threat, their stress, their demographic, their yeah. age, their um, you know, medical history in a different way, and make a decision based on on yeah. that. It just it just appears that it just. I mean, I've only been alive thirty one years, and uh, I haven't seen as much division. In, in my life as I have seen in the past two years, which makes it makes me consider how is this having an impact on our nervous systems, on our ability to connect? How are we going to get out of this? How are we going to move forward? Do you have thoughts on, on those? I do. I, I think we need to first take that deep breath and exhale slowly. And we have to actually realize what where the vagal uh, modulators are that where the neuromodulations of calming come from. They come from social interactions. Uh, they come from intonation of voice. They come from melodic music. There are things we know. They come from movement and social interaction, uh, team sports, or things that people do to calm themselves down. Uh, we need to bring them back into our repertoire. We've basically focused, even during the pandemic, that the only thing that was necessary was to maintain the channels of cognitive functioning. So uh, it was basically online school. It wasn't online uh, romping around or dancing or singing or play. It was all about the pipeline of information into the cortex. And the body under those demands is going to also, in a sense, rebel. I think what you're really sensing is the rebellion of the body. And it doesn't mean that we don't know what to do. What we are, in a sense, the structures of institutions don't know what to do. And we start off by saying intention is not necessarily bad, the intentions, but the implementation doesn't optimize the human experience. And this is where we start the whole idea. What is polyvagal? theory. It's about optimizing and understanding the human experience. And the theme here is if we understand that the pandemic has retuned and continues to retune our autonomic nervous system to a state that is more consistent with defensive reactions, meaning we're in a state of threat, then our social lives and social behavior will not be as complementary, meaning fitting together that type of complement, uh, or synchronous as it should be, could be, and hopefully will be. The problem is, the, we, and, and we're getting there, I, I really feel that there's an acknowledgement of what the risk is. When the pandemic first came, we didn't know if you could touch the same things that other people touch. So we would have people bring groceries and we'd have to in a sense wash the groceries before we ate it. You know, you know, we kind of know that if you wear a mask, if you wash your hands, if you go outside and eat outside at restaurants, you should be reasonably good unless you are really, really immunocompromised. So we have a better understanding that we can have more flexibility. And we know that uh, certain people who have uh, fully vaccinated and boosted, uh, who interact with the same types of people, they should be fine for social networks. But we really haven't implemented, it is, it, it's a, a really compromise of a uh, free society. We haven't implemented safe places. So, mm. yeah. And, and I'm not sure how we do that uh, uh, without compromising individual freedoms. I think this becomes a bit. So if schools could be safe places, uh, what does that mean? It means the kids are inoculated, the teachers are inoculated, and their parents are inoculated. Then does that create, in a sense, enough flexibility? Uh, in, in the U.S., I mean, the, the numbers are still horrendous compared to what you have in Australia. Um, we're basically, as a, as a culture, saying we're living with this. And, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, and, you know, I would say that it was like six months into it, and then um, the system basically gave up. And it even started not even to report the testing results, not providing tests. So it started with a, a, the adaptive reaction was denial. Things aren't as bad. It will blow up when it gets warmer. Everything will be fine. And I think things are much, much better because you can get tests, you can get shots, and that's all there. And, and there's a 
uh, the culture in certain places of accepting masks. And that gives you the flexibility now to basically go see, see your fellow uh, citizens, your fellow inhabitants. You know, it's, uh, it's hard. I thought for me, I would say the first couple of months were the hardest. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't, I had been traveling a lot. I would travel, I would travel once or twice a month, you know, every couple of months, an international trip, you know, having fun, being a good guest, you know, enjoying things. Uh, but um, that one, in a sense, cold turkey, it went into total withdrawal. And we were basically locked down. Now, fortunately, I had, had a, I was with my wife. Now, many people didn't have a significant other, and other people may not like their significant other. And then you start getting all these other issues going on. So in, in many aspects, it's for me, it's been fine. But I would also emphasize that I know that my nervous system got retuned. I know mm -hmm. that a thought of travel, which I used to love, the thought of going to the airport is upsetting to me. The thought of going to the airport, thought of going into the airport lounge, you know, getting your drink or your snack before the flight, which I always used to kind of enjoy as preparation. The thought of being on an airplane is really bothers me, especially mm. with the news about people acting out on planes and people being duct taped to their chairs. You know, just the image of those things are enough to agitate me and say, that's not what I want because travel to me was fun. It was exciting. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Um, it, it. So I'm not ready for that. And mm. I'm trying to now, uh, I would say I'm trying to re-educate my nervous system. Yeah. And I think we, we live in a lovely place. We live oceanfront. So prior to the pandemic, we had a lot of visitors, especially from the more northern states. Lots of friends would you know, come down. It was really great. So you know, once a month or a couple of times, you know, people come for a few days. And there are people you like. And you're socializing, feeling good, and feeling special that you live on the ocean. You know, so you have this nice kind of feeling. Yeah, and you, yeah. You know, take you to the restaurants. You're feeling really good. And that's gone. And that part of my life, that interaction with close friends, is very, very compromised. Um, so I feel that I need to bring people, bring my friends down to kind of rehabilitate me, but also I need to do a live event. So what uh, I was getting lots, you know, these workshops and lectures, and it was, to me, it was very, I would say, socially uh, nourishing. So mm -hmm. it was like, it wasn't, it, you know, it, it's exhausting on one level, but it's not. In a sense, the interaction with the others really made me feel good. I beat new people. They tell me their stories. And, yeah, you know, I felt good about all this. So I'm going to try to do a live event in the town where I live. There's a lovely hotel. And I'm trying to organize this so that this would be my ability, in a sense, to reach mm. back into, re into a physical reality of interacting with others. And it comes back to connection. It's, it, I can relate to so much of what you've just said. Uh, you just the thought of holidaying uh, brings back a, a, a real ambivalence. It's like, yeah. because, because over the past two years, three of our trips have been, have been meddled with. And, and, you know, first one was cancelled. Second one, we, we travelled and then we were in lockdown in the state that we travelled to. The third one had to be cancelled. And now my wife, my wife is like, well, the borders are starting to open up again. I'm just like, I don't, I don't know if I want to do anything. Um, yeah, because well, of, you're retuned. You're getting retuned. Yeah. And, and, the, and the answer is, see, the way the therapist would deal with this, I'm not the therapist you are, is to say, oh, there's no real danger. It's all perceived danger. But there is real danger. <laughs> that is the, the issue. Is. So that's the part that I have to deal with, especially being an older individual, is there is vulnerability. So I can't say to myself, oh, you just go through it and then you'll be fine. The answer is, there's a risk and the risk is different for me than it is for you but the risk is is really uh, i would say relatively high and then what we're learning 
I'm learning is that a lot of people that I know who who traveled, who were quote careful, and then vaccinated, got so-called breakthroughs, and and the symptoms that they experienced varied from nothing to relatively severe. No one was hospitalized, so they're all alive. But is that something I want to deal with either? Because mm. they're. Uh, what we're learning from our own research than doing is the uh, impacts of COVID on autonomic reactivity and on their own uh, subjective uh, sense of bodily reaction. Basically, it messes up their autonomic nervous system and retunes it to be into a state of more chronic threat. So when we talk about long haul COVID or the consequences of it, it's really that the autonomic nervous system is stuck in a state of threat and didn't get the message that the pathogen is no longer viable. Is and that through it, inflammation or body systems? It's well, the, if we think about neural inflammatory, neuroautonomic, it's, it's not in a sense the physiological state is basically a state of threat and it's not serving an adaptive function because the pathogen's gone. It's like chronic pain. You have chronic pain, but you have no damage or no site of injury. The injury is healed. The nervous system got into a state of defense, which pain is or part of, but didn't get the message that the injury is healed. So that's how where I'm thinking are therapies that are very, quote, polyvagal form, sending a message that everything is safe may be very helpful in downregulating those threat reactions. So I'm kind of working in that space now to try to, in a sense, create mm. an intervention model 